Hey, we're on. Okay. There you go. Okay. Uh, this is to call the uh, June 23rd meeting of the Board of the Library Trustees at 6.02 p.m. Prior to the roll call, what we'd like to do is if you would like to make a public comment, if you can go down to the chat, where is the chat? Down to the chat box and put your name, what organization you uh, represent, and what you would like to talk about. Uh, we will call you immediately after we do the roll call. So thank you. So do you want to do the roll call as to who's here from the public first before we do the regular roll call? Call the board first. Okay. So, Dan, can you do the roll call? Please. Sure. Mm -hmm. Thank Trustee you. Trustee Barshas, yes. Trustee Fishman, yes. yes. Okay. Trustee Johnson, absent. Trustee Riddle, here. Absent. Oh, here. Good. Trustee Rogers, here. Trustee Wolf, absent. Absent. Trustee McDonald, here. Okay. Okay. And okay, and I see that we have um, a number of members from the public as well, um, a number of staff. I see Alice Joseph, Amy Barrow, Patsy Devono, Gail Justman, uh, Rebecca Rodanakan, uh, Amy Young, John Risco, Suzanne Arist, and another individual, Jessica Thompson, all from staff. And I see two representatives from the League of Women Voters, Georgia Gephardt and Mary Lawler. And we also have um, someone calling in on the phone, uh, last four digits, 4943. Um, our phone caller, can you identify yourself for us for our record? Uh, caller on the phone with the last four digits, 4943. Would you please identify yourself? Okay. Maybe Kathy they have... Foster from Technical... I'm sorry, can you repeat yourself? From Technical Services. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, I do not see anyone in the chat who has wished to address the board for public comment. Um, if anyone wishes to do so, please speak now. Okay, Lisa, you can unmute yourself again and we can proceed. It looks like we have no public comment. Okay. Given that there's no public comment, uh, let us go and uh, look at the minutes, approve the, uh, review the minutes from the April 21st, 2020 board meeting. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there a motion to adopt them, the minutes from the? I so move. So Second. Okay. So Joan Fishman has moved to adopt the minutes and I'll Jan second. Barshi has seconded it. Is there any discussion on the April minutes? No. Can we have a roll call, Jan, for the mm -hmm. approval of the minutes? Trustee Barshi. Yes. Trustee Fishman. Yes. Trustee Johnson. Absent. Trustee Riddle. Yes. Trusty Rogers? Yes. Trusty Wolf? Not there. And Trusty oh, McDonald? He's here. Oh. He's here now. Here. Oh, Stuart. Okay. Trusty Wolf, approval of the minutes? Yes. I say yes, Jan. I think I got you. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Trusty okay. McDonald? Aye. Behind uh, uh, that, we also have the May 19th, 2020 minutes. Is there a motion to adopt the minutes from May? 19th, 2020. I'll move. So is there a second? A second. Okay. So Jan Barshis has moved to uh, approve the minutes and Stuart has seconded the minutes. Is there any discussion on the minutes from May 19th, 2020? Given that, can we have a, go on? 
So can we have a uh, vote to, uh, can we do a roll call vote to approve the minutes from May 19th, 2020? Okay. Trustee Barshis, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? No, not here. Trustee Riddle? Trustee Riddle? Aye. Okay. <laughs> Trustee Rogers? Yes. And Trustee Wolf? Yes. And Trustee McDonald? Yes. Okay, we're now, given that there are no presentations tonight, we're going to move to the treasurer's report. Trustee Rogers, would you like to give the financial reports for May 2020, as well as the bill and salaries? Okay, the, um, as is usually the case, May is not a high revenue month. We received about $45,000 in revenue from uh, taxes, general fund interest, and miscellaneous income. Um, the, um, uh, there's nothing extraordinary in the expenses. Uh, we're still well below the, um, uh, the rate. We're at 11 months out of the 12. Uh, we've expended uh, about 83% of the funds budgeted and we're 92% through the year. So with one month to go, we're in good shape. There is nothing uh, extraordinary that we need to focus on in the financial report. Uh, so I'm going to move to um, approve the bills and salaries for May, uh, which is which was the attachment immediately following the financial report. I'll second it. Adopt. Move approval of the bills and salaries of the month of May, May 2020. And tr tr Trustee Wolf has seconded the motion. Is there any discussion or questions regarding those? Given that there are none, may we have a vote, please? Roll call mm -hmm. for the approval of the bills and salaries for May 2020. Okay. Trustee Barshas, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson, not there. Trustee Riddle? Yes. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. And Trustee McDonald? Yes. Okay. Uh, that moves us on to the uh, action items. And we would, uh, first we're going to have Trustee Rogers, uh, go over the annual budget for 2020 in conjunction with Director Austin. Okay. Okay, the Finance Committee met on June 16th, a week ago, um, and reviewed uh, the information that you have here before you. Um, the committee recommended that the board adopt the um, uh, preliminary budget as shown. Uh, there are just a few items to highlight uh, that appear in the summary document that you have. Um, uh, the first one is programming, which was reduced uh, by $5,000 because of the expectation of reduced activity. Uh, the second item that, that uh, shifted was professional fees. Uh, money was added to support um, a survey which would become part of our next long range plan. Uh, the next item has to do with a uh, library vehicle uh, purchase that is anticipated. Uh, the actual purchase of the vehicle would be from um, money that was uh, from the endowment fund that we closed last year at, uh, upon uh, the recommendation of the board. Uh, the addition is for vehicle maintenance um, and, and support. Um, and uh, the last item that is shown uh, is the addition of the RFID project, which would um, facilitate improvements in circulation and security. This has been in our, our plan for the reserve funds for a number of years. 
and this is a good time. The committee felt this was a good time to move forward with that project. Um, is there any question or anything further that we need to focus on in looking over uh, these recommendations? So we had a productive conversation uh, at the financial committee meeting. So I, I would motion approval of the uh, of this if that's if that's so appropriate. I um had some questions, um, clarification wait, questions for wait, Anthony wait, this morning. Wait one minute. Can we get a second? And then we'll vote a discussion. Oh, I thought I thought Ron said, "Is there any discussions?" Well, generally it's after the uh, after the motion and the first and the second. So, Stuart, you move the adoption yes. of it. Yes. Did, is there a second from anyone? I'll second the motion. Okay. Now discussion. Go on, feet. There we go. I was um just saying that I had some clarification questions um this morning in a conversation with Anthony and. You may already understand this, but I think it's worth just letting you know what we talked about. Um, I was wondering about the proposed costs from the Inberg Anderson um, report and if that would have any impact on next year's budget. And that report will be coming in July and um, there are some preliminary costs estimated. I should say there are some projected costs, um, but these will not impact next year's budget. They're costs that we can consider in capital spending over the next year, up to 20 years, um, as I understand from Anthony. So um, we, we had a preliminary figure that um, we can, start to think about it our next meeting over the next 10 you know year 20 years <laughs> if we're all here but um i think it's worth not getting um you know maybe caught up on that number because we do have a general fund and we do have the capital reserve or sorry special reserve for the capital expenses thanks Fina, and he's going to come next month and give the report after that report is finalized or it will be available to the trustees as well as the public at that point in time yeah and i think we'll have a special meeting it sounds like i think that might be worth it anthony am i missing anything else from our discussion no i think you captured that all really well Tina. thank you yeah okay right now we've got our budget can we have a, a roll call vote jan is there any other discussion? I just want to make sure that we've got you know room for any other discussion. Any other questions or comments about the budget? I would just note that um, this is the first round in the budget process. Uh, we will have additional opportunities before this is adopted in final form. Mm -hmm. Yes, Ron, it's until like, I think October, right? Or September? I mean, July, of course, but the actual. Well, there's several steps. Uh, the next next step is probably going to be the adoption of the budget and appropriation ordinance, which would be probably in August or September. That's what I recalled kind of from last year. So yeah, August, September, thanks. Okay. Any, any other discussion? Okay. Can we have a vote on approval of the budget, the proposed budget for 2021? Mm -hmm. Okay. Roll call. Trustee Barshus, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? Not here. Trustee Riddle? Yes. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. Trustee McDonald? Yes. Okay. 
papers. Oh, good. Okay. Our next action item is uh, the review of the recommendation of the Finance Committee to cease collection of overdue fines. And we've discussed it several times. And uh, based on, they'll uh, go more in depth, but based on what's going around with other North suburban libraries, it's felt that in terms of goodwill among our patrons, it generally results in increased usage. And at this point in time, we really don't rely on our fines. And it's probably a good time to transition since many of the books have been out for at least three months. And so Trustee Rogers and uh, Director Austin will give you a little bit more detail about the fine free, which would be in effect July 1 if it passes. Basically, we don't, we don't rely on the, the fines. The current, um, currently fines and fees account for less than a half of 1% of our budget and so um it's simply a good time to take you know to move forward with this uh -oh. We've been moving in this direction for several months um other libraries around us are doing similar things and so you know I, the finance committee's recommendation uh was that we proceed with this this as we've discussed uh several times over the last few months um, and uh, zero this line out uh, in our uh, in our coming year budget. Anthony, did you need to add, want to add anything further? Um, I, I think you you've been very succinct, Ron. I think that covers what we've been discussing in finance committee. Um, you will note that uh, in the packet there's um, you know a position paper that that gives a little bit more rationale behind why we have done this. Um, there's also an FAQ in there to talk a little bit more about what the impact is uh, on the public and how we will still manage our circulation operations. Um, I'm happy to address any questions that you may have about the information there and if there's anything logistical that you'd like to, to know. Um, I will say that because a number of our peer libraries are already fine free uh, within the CCS consortium, which are our immediate peer libraries, uh, including Evanston, um, they're there's already a precedent out there and our patrons are already experiencing uh, what a fine free environment looks like in the area. Um, and there's already policy that's, that's in place as well as procedures from uh, the consortium in terms of how the, uh, the catalog will be updated and how we can um, make our, our patrons accounts um, uh, true for what it's worth. I mean, I don't know how else to, to describe that. Basically to clear all of the fines and make sure that, that uh, there are no blocks on any of our patrons' accounts uh, going forward and that there would be no um, overdue fines charged. So um, again, with your, with your motion this evening uh, to proceed with this, we will be able to go back to CCS and to initiate the process um, of making this a reality for our community beginning on July 1. Um, any, and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have about that. Anthony, um, I do. How do you anticipate rolling this out to the community? The usual kind of uh, correspondence and? Um, yeah, I think, you know, this is, for all intents and purposes right now, we are fine free. So in terms of anything new that we would need to make an adjustment for or to help to explain procedures and so on to the public, uh, we're already in this environment. So it's actually a very ideal time for us to do this. There's not an awful lot of coordination that's involved because there's no change. Um, the key piece is to, is to convey it. Uh, the public just isn't aware that, that we're going to cease doing fines. Um, we need to announce it and let them know that we're committed to uh, sustaining our current practices going forward. So um, our weekly communication uh, via email will be a way that we can send that information out, uh, communication through our social media channels, a press release, uh, posts on the website, um, the usual communication uh, methods that we would use. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. I'm just going to take your motion straight off your recommendation. And so um, I move that 
Wilmette Public Library eliminate the imposition and collection of overdue fines for late return of materials. The library will continue to bill and collect for lost items and block patron card access if items are not returned or paid for in a reasonable amount of time. Is there a second? I'll second. Any other additional discussion? Jan, would you like to do a, a, a roll call vote on the approval for the elimination and imposition and collection of overdue fines for late return of materials? Okay. <laughs> Trustee Barshus? Yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? Absent. Trustee Riddle? Yes. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Aye. Trustee McDonald? Aye. Okay. Part C, we have the uh, comprehensive uh, renewal of the contract for the maintenance of our computers and our system. Would you like to talk a little bit about that, Director Austin? Yes, thank you. Um, so the, the, uh, the land management, sorry, I cut, I cut out there. Um, the land management agreement um, is a strategy that we use to manage all of our, our computers locally. And um, we do this because um, uh, the relationship that we have with our land manager, Computer View Incorporated, um, has allowed us to be rather nimble in terms of our technology support. Uh, by contracting with CVI, we are able to get the expertise of a team of at least five specialists who work for the library on a contractual basis um, as experts in a number of fields, either applying software to all of our systems, to managing our servers, to managing our wireless environment, uh, to setting up a virtual private network, the troubleshooting equipment, um, the list goes on and on. And the fact that they're able to provide all of those services on a regular basis to us and that they're in the building um, one day a week to provide those services as well um, for the fee that they're, take, that they're charging us, which is less than I think what it would cost to have a professional, a single uh, professional on staff, um, I feel that we have a, a tremendous benefit um, in our, our technology management through this contract. Um, we've had a long-standing relationship with CBI. They're very familiar with our organization um, and the way that we do business, and uh, they continue to, um, to provide innovative solutions for us. Uh, they continue to, um, to make recommendations for how we can improve our services and try to expand them. Um, and for that, I think CBI has done a wonderful job for Wilmette Library over the years, and I'm happy to present this um, two-year contract renewal for you this evening. And I'm happy to address any questions that you may have. By way of background, before we went to CBI, we had an individual who provided these services. Um, we've been with CBI for more than 12 years. I don't know what the exact number is. But the last year before CBI, we paid $70,000 for these services. The CBI contract is still not reaching that level in this two-year agreement. So this is a bargain. Um, we get far better service than we did from an individual. Uh, and in addition to that, um, it's not costing us as much as it did 12 to 15 years ago. So this is an excellent arrangement for us and it connects us to, they, I mean, CBI basically provides similar services to other public libraries. So it keeps us uh, on the cutting edge of the, the similar services being provided by other North suburban libraries. So this is an excellent arrangement for us at a really good price. A motion to approve? I move that we approve the contract for CBI for the terms and period specified in their agreement. I'll second it. I, okay, I, I actually think that Fina got in before you, Ron, as, as the one who made that motion, just as a correction. So I'll, I'll, second, I'll second either motion. So. so is there any additional discussion? 
So it's been moved and approved. It's been moved by Tina Riddle and seconded by Stuart Wolf that uh, for the um, approval of the comprehensive land management agreement with Computer View Inc. from July 1st, 2020 to June 30th, 2022 for the charge for the first 12 months of $64,600 and for the second term of $65,000 thousand dollars nine hundred can we have a roll call mm -hmm. trustee barshus yes trustee fishman yes trustee johnson not um trustee riddle aye trustee rogers yes trustee wolf aye me trustee wolf I, he said I said, I. yes 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 or i yeah is that an I? I think. Yeah, I said I or yes, yes. Run, running in and out here. Oh, okay. I'll take my video off again. All right. Am I coming through? Yes, yes I can you hear you. Are. I can hear you. I'll just turn my video off in case that makes it better. Trustee McDonald. Aye. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Moving on to Director Austin and the review of the pandemic response and reopening plan update. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so this is what's on everybody's mind right now. As um, I'm sure you're all aware, um, we, we learned this week that um, all of our efforts to do everything that we can as the state of Illinois um, have been fruitful. And um, we are one of the leaders in the country in trying to contain the virus. Um, so it's a good thing that we've been wearing our masks and that we've been sheltering in place and taking all of those steps. And we're going to be moving into phase four of the Restore Illinois plan. Now, as you all know, um, when we began going into this phase and when the governor rolled out or when we, when we began going into the, the closure for the pandemic and when the governor rolled out the Restore Illinois plan, we agreed that um, the provisions that were outlined in um, the Restore Illinois Plans Phase 4, we felt would satisfy the conditions that would be necessary in order for the library to be able to reopen. Um, and the key element of this, too, is the fact that um, the virus is in recession. Um, the risk is lower today than it was in Phase 3. And we are now able to have gatherings of up to 50 people um, in a given space. And because of that, and because of the size of our building, I think that this is a reasonable time for us to move forward with our plans that we have outlined before you here today. Um, so I have updated the documents that we've been reviewing since March, and um, I've included uh, that update here for you today, along with an FAQ. Um, the news, however, I will say that we received on Monday was it was a bit of a shock. So if, if what happens on Friday, and, and we're anticipating that the governor will move the Northeast region into phase four on Friday, what that will essentially do is kick us into high gear here at the library behind the scenes to start um, implementing our plans to move forward. Now, um, as we were initially discussing this as staff and leadership team is meeting tomorrow morning to talk about this news and what's going to happen if this, if this declaration is made, um, there are a number of moving pieces that still need to, to take place for us. Um, we're trying to prepare this building um, for staff still right now. Uh, so right now we're, we're doing our parking lot pickup program and we've been running that since June 1st. And um, we've been running that on four hours a day and um, we're going through our pick list and things are busy. Patrons are really taking advantage of their physical materials and they're really excited to get those materials. And we would like to try to expand that service to try to meet that demand because the demand continues to increase. Uh, so all along our plan has been when we can scale up, we would scale up and we are ready to expand our hours and that's gonna be the next phase um, um, page two of your document, the reopening plan, which is the library stage two. This is what we began on June 1. Now, currently, we are doing an every other day type of schedule where on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we're doing parking lot pickup from 2 to 6 p.m. Um, and you can return your items to the book drops during those hours as well. And on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, we're offering parking lot pickup from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, again, for pickup and returns. 
we would like to try to have a more consistent schedule um, before we open the library. We would like to try to get to our regular operating hours or, or what we're going to have our regular operating hours be uh, going forward um, during the library stage three, which is page three of your document. Um, in order to do that, in order to expand the services that we're offering currently, um, we need to bring more staff into the building, we need to refine our procedures, and start implementing some of the new steps that we're going to have in order to launch the services within the building. There's still a lot of moving pieces that are involved in this process. And I want to make sure that I'm not rambling too much. I want to give you a chance to ask me questions. So I'm going to pull back here in a second because I'm sure you got a lot of questions about this. Um, but the key pieces that still remain for the library right now are that we need to prepare the building. Now we've done a lot of work in the building since we've been closed, but we still need to put up our plexiglass barriers on all of our service desks. We need to make and post all of our signage about what the expectations are for customer service when patrons come back. Um, we need to create all of the appointment software that we're going to need to implement in order for patrons to be able to get the services that they need. Um, that includes booking computers, booking time with librarians. Um, we would like to have uh, an appointment-based system to pick up materials in the parking lot when the library opens because uh, holds historically have been given out at the circulation desk. Patrons are loving the parking lot pickup and we're probably gonna be continuing that for the foreseeable future as an option, uh, especially for those folks who just aren't comfortable coming inside the building. In order to do this, we need to have a location where patrons can reliably pick up their materials. If we're, if we're delivering materials from the parking lot as well as from the circulation desk, uh, coordination of that service is gonna be really critical for staff. And in order for us to do that effectively, we're going to need to implement some new procedures. And so that's going to mean we're going to have to book some appointments for folks. Um, it'll work a lot like it is right now, but it would also allow us to staff um, our, our services more appropriately. As it stands right now, there are some times in the parking lot where it's very busy. And we understand that. And I think if we could have set some limits to start, we might have been able to avoid some of those really busy times. Um, there's also some gaps where patrons just are not coming in. So there may be a half hour where we get one or two cars, and then there may be a half hour where we'll get a dozen cars that'll show up all at once and then have to wait. Um, so we wanna try to avoid that and we can learn from our processes so far and try to improve. And the way that we can do that best and prepare for when we're launching to the public when we reopen the building is to refine all those procedures today and to take some time to develop those for when we reopen the building. Uh, so that's our plan is to, uh, the next, step, next stage is to expand the hours of parking lot pickup to a more regular basis. Um, we haven't quite figured out what the start and finish of that is right now, but let's just assume that it's going to be 9 to 6, Monday through Friday, and 9 to 3 on Saturdays. Um, we, can, we can definitely staff that. We can staff it in our current service model where we're working in teams um, and trying to limit contact between one another on our teams. Um, and then these same hours, I think, would be fairly reasonable for us to launch our in-person services when we're able to open the building again. Uh, but there, like I said, there's a lot of moving pieces still. There's still some supplies and equipment that we're waiting for that are on back order that haven't arrived yet. Chiefly, um, I would like to have these uh, um, Purell hand sanitizer, hand sanitizer stations when you first walk in the library, when you get to elevators and so on, you know, those contact lists. Um, uh, dispensers and the uh, we're on back order on those you know we've got the stands but we don't have the, the Purell so there's still some supplies that are really hard to come by and we want to make sure that we've got enough of everything so that we can sustain operations before we even open the door now as I said um, this is all news to us this week about phase four um, I'm glad that we're talking about this here tonight um, I've talked to a number of my peer directors and I've asked them what their plans are for reopening um, we're all kind of in the same boat, and in fact, the, the plan that you're seeing here um, borrows an awful lot from a number of our peers. We've kind of cherry-picked some procedures from a lot of other libraries. Um, we're all talking about this together, and we're sharing information. That's one of the beautiful things about this industry. Um, now, that said, some libraries have already been open, and we've, we were able to learn from some of their experiences as well. And that's why we want to be very cautious and deliberate with the next steps that we take, because you can't walk back. Uh, when you start to do these services. So we want to be very intentional and move forward step by step in a way that is something that we can maintain, uh, that sets reasonable expectations for the public in terms of the customer service experiences that they're going to have, uh, that we don't stress the staff, uh, that we have adequate resources, including staffing as well as our supplies, 
um, and uh, that we're not going to kick this off too quickly, but we're not going to drag our feet either. So my goal right now is to work with my staff in an effort to set a reasonable uh, opening date for the building around July 13th. So that week is what we're going to target as our opening week. Now that gives us potentially two weeks to get all of our resources in-house and our schedules set to know what roles we're going to be fulfilling, um, what methods we're going to do to try to schedule our services appropriately, and to continue to work on expanding the services in the parking lot. Um, I'm going to be talking through our plans tomorrow with leadership, and we'll try to refine and develop those. And I think this is a reasonable time frame for us to work with. Um, as I said a moment ago, I've talked to a number of my peer libraries. Um, there are a couple libraries, as I said, that are already open, and a few that are opening on July 6th after the, the fourth holiday. Um, a number of our peers are planning to open on the 20th, um, and a few are going to try to open that week of the 13th as well. So I think we're kind of right on target with everyone else in this area in terms of their reopening procedures. Um, so I'm going to take a step back from, from my ramble, and I'm going to give you all a chance to ask the questions that you'd like to ask. One question, uh, this is Jan. Uh, one question that I have is that if you do the parking lot pickups and you continue those and you have the library open, how will you handle all the cars that need to be parked as well as are pick, coming in to pick up? Oh. I, I'm sorry, can you repeat that one, one second for me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. My question is, if you open the library itself and you are continuing the parking lot pickup, how will you handle all the cars that will need to either park or come in for the pickup? Okay, so um, the way that we're going to try to manage this is to make appointments. I think if, if um, now we're not doing that currently, but if we expand our hours, my goal is to try to is try to try to set a reasonable expectation for how many people can come through in like a half an hour time frame. Um, so hopefully there will be some people who will not follow the procedures and they'll show up on their own um, and we will do everything that we can to service those folks. Um, but I do think that if we can say we can process X number of cars within a half hour time frame, um, it could be 10, it could be 15. Um, however many we think is reasonable, just given the traffic flow that we're seeing right now, um, we would set a reasonable amount that we can maintain and then schedule folks for those time frames over the course of the entire eight hour shift that we're doing it. It will make it much more manageable than trying to have it just be a free for all during that four hour time frame that we're doing. And, and what the experience that we've had so far is that the two to six time frame far and away is the most popular one. And um, you know the, the 10 to 2 is what we did this morning, and it was very manageable. It was just a very steady pace. We were people people walking up, they were driving up, et cetera. We managed it just fine. Um, but when but when you get a dozen people that show up at once, and you've only got six spaces, um, right. and you've got five people inside that are trying to you know answer the phones, and the phones are rolling over, and the phones can't keep up with it, um, it's just it showed the limitation of our phone system for one thing. Um, but it just it's stressful. And I think it set an unrealistic expectation for the staff and an unrealistic expectation for the public. We acknowledge that. We, we can do better. And I think the way that we can do better um, is by trying to move towards a more appointment-based system. So I think it, you know, we'll, we'll be able to scale it based on the metrics that we've got right now. OK, thanks. Other questions? Uh, one question. I know that Rails begins pickup on tentatively on June 29, around there, around July 1st. But at this point in time, you cannot, do you know when you will be able to get, they'll start delivering and interlibrary loan will be up to speed delivering books from other libraries? Because right now when you go on the website, you can't do it. Right, so um, the way that that's gonna work right now, and this is, there's still a lot of detail to be developed here, but the way it's working right now is, um, uh, we we just received a delivery last week of all the materials that Rails had been holding since March, <clears throat> and uh, there's still more to more to come. So we're still processing a lot of that material, or expecting to process a number of that material. Um, a number of our peer libraries are also accepting returns now, 
Um, so uh, Winnetka just launched that service this week. Um, and so they're collecting materials um, that might belong to Wilmette. Um, and we certainly have materials that belong to Winnetka, for example. Um, so we have boxed up all of our materials that are due to go to Winnetka, and those have made their way back to Rails, but they haven't been delivered to Winnetka yet. Um, our materials that have been collected at other libraries are due to arrive here um, by the end of next week. That's that target date that we were saying before of, of like June um, 29th, I think, is when we're expecting to receive those materials. So um, that's just returns. Now that doesn't include holds yet. Um, so patrons are currently still only able to get materials at their home library. And that's kind of, that's just across the board throughout the rail system. Um, until more libraries are um, up and running and have opened their buildings now that we're in phase four, I think interlibrary circulation is, um, is, is not going to happen until the, more of those conditions are met. We're not there, and I don't have a clear answer for you about that yet. Um, we're going to receive some materials, but they're not going to be whole materials. So if Wilmette residents would like to place a reserve on an item at, say, the Glenview Library, um, they can't do that yet. They can still only request items that are right here at Wilmette Library at the moment. But we anticipate that now that libraries are going to start to reopen, um, and I think Glenview is, in fact, one of those libraries that's opening on July 6th, um, pretty soon I think we'll be able to see um, some of those materials being available to our patrons so that they can bring them in here. Does that make sense? I, I was really rambly there. Okay. And the other question is, how do you plan... To, in terms of patron expectations of the phase in, because I don't know if you're gonna have chairs available for them to sit or if it's just gonna go browse initially, browse and pick. How do you plan to communicate the different phases and what, because there's been sort of a gap, you know, other than they know they can pick up this, but I think it might be helpful if you, you know, it'll be a moving target, but if you have some scope of where, what you see as a timetable for happening. Yep. So with your approval, okay, great. With, with your approval tonight of this plan, um, we will be able to put this plan up on, on the website, make this our FAQ, and, uh, and start to push out those communications. So within the next week, um, we'll be able to, to make posters that we can put on the windows of the library, get e-blasts out to folks, send the, the weekly emails with specific updates about our reopening plans. Um, we can get it up on social media through all of our, our regular communication channels. So that will give us more definitive clarity about um, how we can communicate this. So in terms of you know, what a patron's expectations for experience are inside the reopened library, it's kind of like this. Um, all right, so, uh, and I'm gonna mute you just for one second, Lisa. Sorry, I'm getting some feedback. Um, so here's what's going to happen. When you approach the library, um, we're going to make sure that you've got your mask on. Um, it is still a village ordinance and still a state law that you need to be wearing a mask when you are out in public, and that is our rule when you come in the library. You need to wear a mask. We understand that not everyone can wear a mask, that you may have a medical reason for why you cannot wear one. So we're going to have to set up special hours for those patrons who are vulnerable, or establish services for those folks who cannot wear a mask in order to enter the building. And that's another reason why we want to continue to offer our parking lot services and scale some other services that patrons may expect but can't do so without a mask. All right, so those are some other details that we're trying to work out. But to get in the door, we want a mask. So most people can do that. So you come in the library. Um, we're not having any programs because it takes months to prepare those and there's no programs. Our main programming rooms are currently filled with quarantined materials. Um, I'll get to that subject again here in a second, um, as well as a number of, of things that are currently in storage. Um, we are, are, because we need to limit how many people can gather in a place at once, um, we need to also um, take some of the, the seating options away. Um, we can't have folks gathering uh, all around the library and in large groups. So we need to try to space out the furniture to ensure social distancing. Um, some rooms will, will need to be closed at the beginning. We'll try to launch those services again at some point in, this, in the future. But we're going to start with, I think, a few more restrictions, just trying to manage those expectations early on. Um, so no programs, no rooms to book. Um, uh, there won't be any, any toys or interactable things for children to do. Um, children can still come in and browse the collections. Um, 
and collect their materials. You can still interact with library staff. Um, you can meet with librarians. You can use computers. Um, however, our computer room is, is a real challenge. Um, it's a tiny space. There are 12 computers that are currently in that room and uh, people are right up on top of each other. We're gonna have to remove at least half of the computers in that room and spread those out elsewhere throughout the building and we, we've got a plan for how we're gonna do that. Um, and we're gonna set up a system for patrons to be able to make reservations in order to get one-on-one -on -one assistance with the computers. Now, the majority of patrons that come in don't need um, uh, a librarian's assistance. Uh, however, some do. And that we wanna make sure that those folks are gonna be able to get the service they need uh, so that's one of the reasons why we want to have reservations. Um, and basically, the, the library is open for you to browse the collections and to collect uh, your physical materials to check out, not linger very long, and, uh, and move on. Um, we're not going to invite people to, to stay for the entire day. I think we want to we want to encourage people to, to move along. And we need to limit how many people are going to be in the building at any given point as well. So we're going to we're going to have to estimate per our square footage reasonably how many people the building can hold in terms of its capacity. And we will likely need to count how many folks are in the building at a given time. Now, I don't think that we're going to have to stop people at the door because on average, we would have about a thousand people who come through the library on a given day. Our, our approximate square footage is about 70,000 square feet. So I think, you know, if people were able to fan out a little bit in the building, we can have a, a few more. And I think if there's 100 people in the building at a given time, um, that, that could be about the limit of what we could handle, mainly because the entrance to the library is a bit of a pinch point. Um, you cannot reasonably socially, socially distance at that entrance to the library. Uh, that, that door opens six feet. So, you know, we want to make sure that people can, can pass um, reasonably in that space. Um, yeah. It, um, Lisa, were there other questions that I glossed over there that you had regarding that? Okay, other, other questions about what your experience would be when you're at the library? I think, we, I think there's an awful lot here that we're going to figure out as we go along. Um, I, you know, I, I move that we proceed with the reopening plan um as presented uh with the understanding that uh, more details are going to happen as we figure it out is there a second i'll second okay so trustee rogers has moved to approve the plan as presented with a second by trustee barshis any other additional discussion can we call for yeah, I didn't I wanted to be able to just tell you that I also asked Anthony we spoke about this briefly this morning and I think it's also worth mentioning that um, for the children's area I think that it's going to be um, it's going to the caution will be taken to um, consistently wipe down the services the surfaces um, and that you know it's not going to be a long lingering um, period uh, allowing people to to linger for a long time children to linger for a long time and that you know it that gave me a lot of comfort um to bring in the kids and um food obviously won't be allowed in that area when snacks sometimes used to be um so i think that um families with young children can also feel comfort in bringing um their kids by and you know, picking out their materials. The summer reading program is, you know, always really popular. And and I think it's still gonna be, um, there can still be a good turnout for that. So, um, and I really liked, we talked about the vulnerable um, population and I really liked the ability for um, those folks to have certain hours um, dedicated to their visits. So that, that was um, what we spoke about this morning. Great, thank you, Fina. Roll call. Mm -hmm. Trust, Trustee Barshis, yes. Trustee Fishman. Yes. Trustee Johnson, absent. Trustee Riddle. Aye. Trustee Rogers. Yes. Trustee Wolf. Yes. And Trustee McDonald. Aye, thank you. 
And now we're moving to looking at discussion items in terms of our director has been doing a standard each time. So right now behind there, we're going to look at serving our public number four. And it goes into collection management. OK. Um... I don't want to linger on this topic too long, um, but I can give you the highlights. Um, all right, so when it comes to collection management, the library meets and exceeds the standards set forth by um, the state here. Um, you may be curious about like this first item, for example, the standard is library spends a minimum of eight to 12% of its operating budget on materials for patrons. The budget that we've just approved for fiscal year uh, 2021 is a bit of a modification from our current operating budget. However, we are spending 15% of our operating budget on our material collection, which is pretty outstanding for a public library. Uh, considering all the other expenditures that we have uh, to sustain our operations, um, we do place an awful lot of, uh, of precedence on our collection. That's one of our prime resources. Um, we have a clear uh, board approved written collection management policy that is reviewed on a regular basis. Um, it is due for review before our policy committee, and we will add that to our slate for review going forward, um, but it remains current. Um, and um, all the guidelines that, the, that our professional library staff use to, um, to maintain and uh, weed the collection are also consistent with the practices that are established here in the standards. Um, we use the weeding guidelines that are recommended um, here as well. Um, as well as ensuring that the breadth and depth of our collection meet the needs of the community. Uh, we do provide um, access to materials in a variety of formats, and that continues to grow and evolve with the addition of that library of things, as well as um, increasing our digital resources. Um, uh, number eight on, um, uh, on the standards says that the library strives to um, complement its print collection by purchasing electronic materials. As you know, um, that has been a huge piece of our operations here during the pandemic. And um, we are posting a 25% increase to those collections in this next fiscal year. Um, so we are definitely committed to that. And I will say that Wilmette Library's patrons um, were very early adopters to digital collections and have been strong users of these for years. So um, kudos to, to our community for taking advantage of those resources. Um, I would also say kudos to our community for how we use interlibrary loan. Um, Wilmette Library is a gross lender of um, interlibrary loan materials. Because of the quality of our collection, patrons from not only our own community, but other communities throughout the state and country rely on the quality of our collections. And um, we respond to a lot of those interlibrary loan requests in order to serve that. Um, so that is, that's outstanding, as well as, obviously, as we know, the strong circulation in our community. Our patrons use our collections aggressively, and they also take great advantage of our interlibrary loan services. Um, we are in compliance with all the standards, and I think we just need to continue to, to make, make sure that we um, fulfill these. Uh, as I went down the checklist, I also wanted to note that the library considers forming a cooperative collection plan with other libraries in close proximity to one another. Um, that is certainly what we're doing as part of our partnership and membership with the Cooperative Community uh, Computer Services, uh, CCS system. Uh, with a 26-member system, we're certainly very collaborative with them and uh, participate in an awful lot of resource sharing and partnership there. So um, I, I feel that we're, we're leaders in, um, when it comes to collection management, especially for a uh, collection and building of our size. Um, and that is, that's my position on that matter. And I think that we're, we're doing a fab job. So cheers. <laughs> any, any questions about collection management at Wilmette Library? No, when I saw this, I went and reread the policy. So no, you all do an excellent job. And I can find, once you started curbside service, I could get most of the books I wanted without even going through interlibrary loan. So it's a wealth of information wealth of a wealth of a collection so thank you awesome thanks to taxpayers okay okay we are moving any other comments regarding collection management mm -hmm. or questions anthony? okay we're moving to the director's report and before anthony uh 
talks about the director's report, I'd like to just talk a little bit about the statement that uh, the library and I think the staff approved and I also approved it regarding, and it was basically the library's position in relation to George Floyd event and all the other events that were occurring. And what I thought it was important was that he, I think one of the things I think is key is that the library is a place where all are welcomed and treated with dignity and respect. Our collection services and resources reflect the diversity of our community while also providing new opportunities to engage with neighbors and learn about cultures and viewpoints. And he also included, the library staff also included a list of resources. I didn't contact the trustees and ask whether the trustees should put a statement because I think that the public measures us by what we do. And ever since I've been in Wilmette for 28 years, this is probably the first place that I felt welcome with my kids because it was open, it was a warm environment, and there was always somebody to help you and to lend a free arm. Plus, it's one of the few places where I volunteered my efforts other than the school, and that was just to keep an eye on what my kids were doing. So I I felt no need, I think, for the trustees, and I would love to hear from some of the other trustees to state it because I think we do by the programs we that the library puts on as well as the resources that they put to op having an open environment and encouraging discussion with our partners as well as with staff in terms of hosting it be it one book will met you know where they brought in you know where they might bring a Haitian author in it's always been pretty diverse for such a community with such a small percentage of African Americans. Mm -hmm. Any other comments regarding that statement? And it was on page two and three, and you would see it at the front of the website. Mm -hmm. Other than the fact that maybe it would be a nice step to have that statement, though, particularly okayed by the uh, trustees that were in total agreement with it and have that stated somewhere. Okay. So would you like to affirm the motion? Would you like to affirm the statement that was created by staff? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So would you like to make a motion? I yeah. move, yeah, I move that the trustees of the Wilmette Public Library are totally in favor of the, mo of the wording that was used and we support it all the way. I will second the motion and the endorsement. Mm -hmm. okay. Any discussion? Um, Lisa, I just want to echo what you said. I mean, I, I'm obviously coming from this as a white male, but I both as a library patron and then once I entered the board um, and was involved with all kinds of behind the scenes library discussions and activities, I was always struck by the fact that there was a really strong um, sense of inclus inclusivity. Um, and that went uh, to things both of cultural, uh, ethnic background, as well as obviously the, the various age demographics that we um, cater to as a library, uh, as well as people who come from all different walks of life, um, as well as um, uh, whatever uh, physical challenges they might have. I just, I feel we've done, that I've always been impressed with the library seeming to kind of stay um, at the forefront of that. Again, I know we're not perfect, but I think we keep striving to do um, to serve the community as best we can, and I think we keep we've been getting better. And um, and, I, and and so I'm encouraged, just like you said, Lisa, by by um, what I've experienced as a board member and as a patron. There's a motion that's been moved by Trustee Barshis and seconded by Wolf that we affirm and support. And so it's time for a vote. Okay. <laughs> Trustee Barshis, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson, absent. Trustee Riddle? Yes. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. And Trustee McDonald? Aye. And thank you for work. Thank you for working on that, Lisa. Well, we were playing with all kinds of things, and I got so sick of seeing all those statements come in my <laughs> inbox. <laughs> From every every organization there is, and I said, I you know, and I know with some of them. So some you knew that they bought the talk, so you would look at it and read it, and they they right. share by action. But most of them was just yeah. oh well. 
fluff. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving on to your report, and two of our trustees are going to need to jump off. Thank you. Yes, I'm going to leave now. Thank you. Bye bye, Stuart. And so am I. Thank you very much. Yes. I am too. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you all. Can, can we start the next meeting earlier, maybe, just so we, uh, we can talk about that later? But yes, thank you. Well, wait a minute. Can we start at, well, you've got the majority here, so, but. Can we start at five? Huh? Can we start at five, four? I don't know. Uh, I'll send a note out to everybody, the, to those okay. that aren't here. It's fine with me. I prefer early. I do, too. So do I. I do, too. It works for me. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Well, I just want to. All right. Thank you, Lisa. I, I want to reiterate what, what Lisa just said a moment ago. Um, you know, it, when it comes to these statements, um, it is true that I think um, every agency and business um, started issuing statements and recognized the horror of what happened um, and was so clearly exposed. I, I think um, the exposure of systemic racism is something that we do need to boldly face. And I think as, a, as an organization in our community, the library is uniquely positioned as the community's living room. We, we have an opportunity to bring people together, uh, to edify one another, um, to explore the things that make us unique, and uh, to help build empathy in, in one another. Um, I think that we do that through our programming. I think that we've done that and established that through um, community conversations that we've begun to cultivate, um, whether it's through the Better Angels program, where we've learned how to talk across the political divide, or through other events that we've got built into our strategic plan. We have an ongoing commitment to try to foster those types of relationships and understandings. Um, and we're also working to do that inside the library um, on an internal basis to look at our implicit biases, to see if any of our policies or structures that are currently in place um, are, are working against our mission to try to welcome everyone and make everyone feel uh, as though they do get the dignity and respect that they deserve when they are here. Um, so what I wanted to reiterate is that, yes, it is one thing to make a statement, uh, to put together resources to share with the community, to help to educate and expose um, a number of these concerns that we clearly have. Um, but we also, we need, to take the, we need to take that recognition to the next step, um, and that is to take action. And that is what I felt was necessary to make in this statement, is that we, we've, we've seen this, okay? This is nothing new. Um, we understand that systemic racism and structural violence uh, exist in our society. And I wouldn't think that a library would necessarily need to be positioned in a way to make such a statement. But that's something that our industry recognized, that we noticed that this was clearly in conflict with the way that we operate. We had to take, we had to take a stand. We had to say something. We can't just sit here. Um, and recognize, as, as leaders in our community and um, within the staff of our organizations, um, that we can use our own resources to try to be better people ourselves. Uh, to try to recognize bias in ourselves, and uh, to try to perpetuate a more open and welcoming environment inside the library. And the way that we are going to do that going forward um, is to put, put these words into action. Uh, the library, as per our strategic plan initiatives, has already established an equity, diversity, and inclusion committee. Um, it is a diverse committee, and um, they've already done outstanding work. Um, this week, we have um, some members of our team are going to be participating in the YWCA Equity Summit. Uh, it's a virtual conference. Um, there was to be an in-person conference that was to happen, I believe, like two days after we closed the library for the pandemic, I mean, earlier in March. Um, I'm thrilled to see that uh, the YWCA is still able to hold that event um, yet this summer. Uh, so we'll be participating in that, and I'll share more information about that in the next director's report uh, when I've got that feedback from the staff. Um, but I just wanted to make sure that it, it was underscored here today that it is one thing to put out a statement, but it is another thing to try to walk that talk. Um, we're not afraid to have those conversations and to try to, to try to be leaders in our community to make this a better community to live in for everyone. Um, so that's, that's why we felt we needed to make a statement and to, to do something quickly about this. All right, so um, I'm going to, to leave it at that <laughs> for right now. Um, since we are down to three trustees, um, I think I, at this point, I want to be really brief about the content that's in, that's in the director's report. And I would like to speak specifically to uh, what your individual concerns are. I mean, I could sit here and, and reiterate everything that's in my report. I'll tell you a few things. Um, one, um, we're really excited about our summer reading program. 
Um, it is officially underway. And um, we have a, a great partnership that's going on um, with the bookstall for our finishers um, and uh, for our, our younger folks um, for, as a midway prize. Um, Dairy Queen is partnering with us as well. So there's all kinds of motivation to read. Um, we're encouraging all ages to participate. Um, so um, the challenge this year is to try to read across genres. And if you need help with where, to, with where to start, with trying to read something that's maybe outside of what you would normally read. Um, I may be reading a romance novel this summer, for example. Um, our librarians can help you to, uh, to find your, your next favorite read. Um, so I would definitely recommend that you check out our website that's dedicated to our summer reading program. Um, links to that are also in our weekly uh, e-blasts that go out and are on the front page of the website. Um, the program is virtual this year. Um, however, if we move forward with opening the library, there will still be opportunity for you to uh, participate here inside the library as well. Um, so we're excited about the, the summer reading program. And I want to say too, if you haven't already seen our summer reading video, um, it's really fun. And um, we were able to share that with all the, the schools. Um, and that video was seen by the students in our schools. Um, I was hoping I could get affirmation from some of the parents out there, but. Anyway, um, the, the video um, hopefully has, has crossed uh, families' um, screens at home. Um, also, screens at home for students. Um, on May 11th, Nutra High School held its annual um, day-long virtual conference to, um, for parents and students to learn more about the digital resources that are available for their students. And uh, three local libraries that serve the Nutra um, High School uh, participated, as we do. And um, information about that is listed on the first page of my report. Um, we got nice accolades for all the digital resources that we have. So I just wanted to make sure our team got recognized for that. Um, I posted some statistics in our digital collections portion of the report. Um, we're continuing to see really strong usage of the digital collections. Um, I, I will say um, I, I want to recognize that this is not fully replacing physical material circulation at the library. While these numbers are really strong and the growth is, is outstanding, um, we recognize that our patrons still very much rely on their physical materials, which is another reason why we want to make sure that we continue to grow and develop uh, these physical material circulation procedures that we're putting forth this summer. Um, and the staff has done an outstanding job of scaling back um, since we've been closed. Um, we've had our technical services team is, has done a fantastic job of getting all of these brand new materials um, in inventory uh, process, getting those invoices in so we can be sure that um, they're paid in this current fiscal year. That was a lot of catch up because we continued to build carts and order materials while we were closed. It just meant that when they got back in the building, it was really speedy. Uh, that team has done a fabulous job. Um, and they deserve your praise. Um, I'm really excited about what I'm seeing coming out of that department right now. Um, I'm also really impressed by the way that circulation and shelving staff have been able to pivot. Um, in my report beginning on page six, um, uh, circulation manager Luciana Ward has put together a report for us kind of outlining what the steps were to get us scaled up. There were so many aspects of that operation that needed to be studied and coordinated in order for us to do that parking lot pickup. And I'm really impressed by how well that team has been able to develop and adapt their, um, their services in order to provide that, that much valued service to the community. Um, so like I said, we're, we're excited to be able to build on what we've done there uh, to try to improve some things that have been less successful and uh, to try to launch into this new environment when we're ready to open the library um, later in July. Um, I think that's all I wanted to touch on at the moment. Um, is, are there any questions that you specifically had from my report that you would like to explore? I can give you two more things that I wanted to share. There are some communications um, that were appended to my report. So outside of, of everything that I reported in my, in my, um, my, my regular monthly report, I attached a couple articles. One of them came directly from the ILA reporter. Um, and that is this article about um, um, maker spaces. It's called When Libraries and Makers Meet, Increasing Community Engagement Through Maker Activities. Um, in just two years, our Maker Fest event has been a tremendous success. And without even having a maker space, a dedicated location for us to offer these services, 
Uh, Wilmet Library has already gotten recognized in the state as being a leader um, in our maker services. Um, so we were just one of the few libraries that was highlighted in this article, and I wanted to make sure that you were aware of that piece that's included in there. Um, and I think that's all I wanted to mention. Um, any, any questions about um, any operational details from the month of May that you would like to explore? Not a question, but I would just like to make a statement that I'm sure uh, would be backed up by all of our trustees, that we are all amazed, pleased, and proud of what everybody is doing at the library to make things work. It's, an, it's been a real journey up to this point. Um, everybody has bought into it. I think it's just been wonderful. We really see what this library can do. And personally, Anthony, I know that you've been working nonstop throughout the whole <laughs> pandemic, so thank you for your leadership. Thank yes. you. And My I pleasure. When I went for um, pickup, uh, very easy. It wasn't crowded. So <laughs> my timing I must have been just happenstance. But um, I'm sure patrons are, as you say, happy to get those books in their hand. And I think you've made it very seamless that um, as best that making best of a scenario that no one could anticipate. So thank you. Worked very well. And your thank post you. Facebook, I mean, I, I think those have all been great and getting the word out and um, all, all excellent. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for your support. Uh, going to the committee reports. Anything, Jan, Trustee Barshis from ILA or uh, oh. Rails? Yeah. There were a couple of things. Uh, give me a minute here. Um, uh, they made a couple of statements that were interesting. And one was uh, from the ILA, of course, condemns racism and violence. It is incumbent, but we aren't helpless, is what it said. It is incumbent upon us to consider these conditions in our sphere of influence, which is librarianship. So the more that the library and we can do to help people understand what's going on and to broaden their perspectives, the better off we'll all be. And um, let's see, there, were, there was a list and I'll just read it quickly for you of things that um, can possibly be done uh, to help that librarians can do right now that they have suggested. Number one was to recommit, this is interesting, to promote the importance of the census in your community, particularly among hard to count populations. Now I know the last st statistic I saw on the number or the percentage of uh, people who had uh, done the census was fairly high, but I think there was still, if I'm not mistaken, something like 20% have not responded. So that may be something we want to encourage. Making plans to encourage voter registration via your program in, in advance of fall 2020 elections. Identify and reach out to one or one new anti-racist organization in your community to offer partnership and support. Read one of the articles on any kind of lists or one like it and promote the titles and resources in your collection that address inclusion, equity, and anti-racism via book lists or book talks. And they mention as the Evanston Public Library has done. Tried to do a little research on that, but I had no success. Uh, today, so I'm not sure what Evanston has done or if we can learn from that. But anyway, we're doing a great job, and uh, I think we're right, right there, uh, as far as the ILA. Some of the things Evanston has done is through James Baldwin. They have all his books, but they break up in about eight groups, 
And uh, so those discussions tend to be based on what James is writing. And then they have a lot of support material. So, but that their program is based on what their patrons recommend. And then yeah. they just sort of blow it up. Mm -hmm. And so I've been doing that all this year. So I've enjoyed that a lot mm -hmm. because it's, you've got diverse people talking. They're doing it by Zoom now. But I think if you have a diverse population, you get a little bit more different oh, yeah. plant as opposed mm -hmm. to women. Right. So Amazon's a little more suited for that. And with your thing about voting, I think one of the things that perhaps the librarians can be trained for is there's an app called We All Vote, and all you got to do is just give it to the patron, and they scan it, and they can go directly to it. Plus, Cook mm. County just sent the thing out for direct mail for your ballot, and so perhaps mm -hmm. maybe uh, there could be some posters or some signage in conjunction with Cook County that you can, because uh, I just signed up for my mail-in ballot for fall, mm -hmm. fall. So I think those mm -hmm. are two things in terms of working to, you know, working with Cook County, working with the league, right. we all vote that you can utilize staff to encourage mm -hmm. voting and make mm -hmm. it simple. Mm -hmm. Now, when you were talking about the the uh, book, the book discussions, is that something that the uh, ILA was part of, or was this no. separate? The book oh, okay. discussion was through Evanston, oh, you're Evanston. Evanston Public Library. There was an example of what they did, and they had a big kickoff. Okay. They had about they had overflow of about 120 people. They brought a professor in, and then you broke up in the small groups that uh -huh. were facilitated discussions throughout the year for all three of his books. And now okay. they're doing it on Zoom. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll try. I'll try to look that up. Yeah. And that's it for mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything else, Anthony, to add about rails? Because you sort of gave us the update in the middle of the question I had asked. I, I do. And actually, you know, there's a there's a really critical piece of information that was shared yesterday from rails that um, I should have mentioned during our pandemic conversation and I just rambled and never got back to it. A very critical piece of information. So um, as I mentioned early on in the pandemic, one of the biggest challenges to libraries and library circulation was trying to find out how viable the coronavirus is on the physical materials that were circulating. Um, and quarantine was one of our was one of our biggest challenges as an industry. Um, the initial guidance that we were receiving from two studies indicated that we should be quarantining our materials for seven days. And until um, yesterday, when we received an update from the IMLS study, which is known as the Realm study. Um, you can find information about that on the, uh, the Rails COVID information page. It's right at the top. Um, there's a direct link to it. Um, they have, they're doing a longitudinal study and they have learned that um, after their initial studies, uh, the viability of the virus appears to drop off sharply after the third day. So we feel comfortable now with, with updating our procedure and we will no longer be quarantining materials for seven days um, and we will be doing it for three days going forward. Now this will help us to turn our materials over more quickly. It will help us to manage our deliveries um, more efficiently because we've been quarantining deliveries, the mail. Um, so this will help us to move a little bit more effectively. Um, and it also gives us, I think, a little bit more comfort about um, how long uh, or, or how safe the materials are that are being circulated in the community. Um, it still is a little concerning, though, to know that the virus can live on library materials. Um, so that is, that is the reason why we want to quarantine everything and that we want to take all appropriate measures to make sure that the steps that we're taking inside the library when the building reopens um, will be there to promote the health and safety of the staff as well as the public. Mm -hmm. um, so that is a key piece of information that has been shared by Rails this week. Uh, so Rails has updated their recommendation to the entire system. So all libraries in the Rails system are going to start relaxing their quarantine procedures to three days now. Okay. And you're comfortable with that? I am. Um, having read that, now I'm not a scientist, uh, and it's a pretty detailed scientific study. There's a lot of information in there. Um, but I have I have consulted the pages that they referenced, and I do feel comfortable um, bringing that forward um, and making that change. I, I think it's appropriate. Okay, good, because that's kind of drastic from seven to three. It is, but the science seems to support it now. Okay, good. So then that brings up what you were talking about earlier in a, in another discussion we had is when the library opens and people start browsing. Yeah. 
have have there been any procedures that other libraries have institute have thought about have, within your peer group and brainstorming as to how you what do you do about the browsers or is there any safe way to browse because gloves you say i know people think gloves contaminate more than they say than yeah they that's kind of my position um I, I think the gloves are more problematic i think you just kind of spread the mess around a little bit more when you wear gloves uh, the best thing that gloves are good for is it reminds you you're wearing them so you don't touch your face um, but I, I still think people should just be washing their hands regularly and sanitizing. So um, as long as folks are wearing masks, I think that's the first step. Um, so if someone is asymptomatic and is in the library um, and potentially is carrying the virus, if they're wearing a mask, that will radically control how much of the virus could potentially be spread. Um, it doesn't completely limit that. And we're well aware that there could be someone in, in the building who could potentially spread the virus. And that is why we need to make sure that we've got all these other procedures in place to try to sanitize the library as we go forward. Um, we're going to be cleaning uh, regularly just the way that we did at the very beginning of the pandemic. We're going to start doing all of that once the public comes back in. Uh, so regularly wiping and cleaning all of our surfaces and doing more disinfecting. Uh, the quarantining is also a procedure that is, we, we weren't doing that at the beginning of the pandemic because we didn't know about that at the time. Um, however, uh, another measure that we're going to be taking in terms of cleaning is we have purchased a UV light. Um, and this UV lamp can be moved from room to room and can help to disinfect surfaces um, much more effectively than trying to wipe down stuff. Uh, the UV light um, basically works like a flashlight in the sense that if you can shine a light on it, then it will kill whatever is alive on that surface. Um, it even kills bed bugs. Um, so anyway, but uh, <laughs> we don't we don't have that problem. But um, but if we did, um, it would help with that. But I like the light. I really do. And I think the light is kind of cool because, you know, we think of a space like an elevator and we're going to have to limit how many people can be inside of an elevator. But the easiest way to clean that thing, that big box, um, is to just put that light inside of that elevator and run it uh, for that, that short cycle. I don't think it needs to run more than a minute. Um, and then you've completely disinfected that elevator and then you can put it right back in service. So there's a way that we can kind of turn some of these spaces around. If there's rooms that we need to disinfect throughout the day, you can just turn on that lamp, um, close the door, um, and then you know move on. Um, so that's a, another procedure that we're going to be implementing here soon, too, to try to impl um, implement some more sanitation standards. Um, but but to, to your question, Lisa, before, um, what can we do to ensure, um, uh, what have we seen from other libraries? Um, a piece that I think is a little concerning to me is how do we handle our more ephemeral materials? So think about like today's newspaper. A lot of patrons want to come in the library and read the, local, the, news, the newspaper. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's only good for a day or two that someone's going to come in and read it, but that's how long the virus might live on that thing. Should we be offering access to the newspaper? Is that a reasonable risk that we want to put forward? These are some questions that we have to address. Some libraries are allowing people to browse newspapers and magazines. Others are not because they can't, they can't be guaranteed or certain that the, that the virus isn't going to be present on that. Um, another question comes to um, browsing materials. Um, all throughout the library, we have these carts where patrons can put down the materials that they've looked at when they're in the library, but don't want to reshelve. Um, and it is entirely possible that people will be browsing books, take them off, read the jacket and say, no, I don't want that thing and put it right back on the shelf again. Well, a couple minutes later, another person could come in, pull that item off the shelf. And if the person who had it before had the virus, could it be on the book? Maybe. Uh, so those are some things that we need to look at um, and try to consider it. But I think what the prevailing uh, consensus is right now amongst the libraries who are already open and are allowing browsing is that that possibility of transmission is so limited um, and, uh, and the risk is so low that they are not disinfecting those materials and you cannot reasonably disinfect every item when you open your building. It's just, it's impossible. But it raises an interesting point and it means, you know, for me, it, it just reinforces why we want to be very intentional and deliberate about how we reopen. While we have been given the green light to do so, um, I, today I am still very much concerned by the fact that we are still in the middle of a pandemic. We don't have a vaccine for this virus. And I predict that we will very likely be closing the library again at some point in the near future. I look down, you know, to a southern state like Florida right now, and the cases are surging in that, in that area. 
if any resident of our community goes down to Florida right now, they could potentially bring the virus right back with them. And if we relax any of our procedures um, that we have been praising ourselves for right now about wearing masks and so on, we could find ourselves with a local outbreak again before you know it. So we can't fall down on this thing. The, the, the pandemic is still a very real concern and we need to take every precaution that we can. So as I said before, I'm glad that, that, you have, that you've approved our plan and that you've given us the go ahead to, to, to proceed with, with our reopening procedures, but we're gonna do so with an abundance of caution. And if we need to, to restrict a few things in, the, in the, the meantime, before we launch our services back completely, I just want the community and everyone to understand that we are doing so in a precautionary method to try to take care of our community. We do not want to be a site of potential transmission of the virus. We want to take care of the staff and the public, and we're going to do everything that we can to keep everyone healthy and safe. Um, so that's, that's kind of where I'm at right now. Um, I think there's still a number of questions, and I can't tell you with definitive certainty which individual collections we're going to restrict and which ones are going to go forward. That still needs to be discussed. Um, but th the risks are there, and I think they're real, and I don't want us to ignore that. So as an organization, um, I want the public to feel comfortable and confident that we're doing what we can to protect them, and uh, that's my position on the matter. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, All right. Thank you. I think that... Any communications from suggest? Well, there have been no suggestion boxes. I, we've gotten some communication. There was one patron that wanted to know why I weren't, since the Chicago Public Libraries were open, why we weren't open. Mm -hmm. What else? And the other one was about why during regular hours can't the phone the, the phone be answered it by a person. Those were two comments that I've gotten. Yep, and I was copied on that message as well. Um, and I called that patron back, and we and we talked about it at length. And I think he was fairly comfortable with the responses that we gave, and, and understood the complexity. On the surface, I think it's hard for folks to compare a library service that we're offering versus what you're getting at a curbside restaurant or in a grocery store. Um, the key difference here is that our materials by our service model are shared, and we are a community gathering place. Um, everything in this building has to be disinfected regularly. Uh, so there, you know, and, and why one library is open and why another is closed? Well, part of that, I don't want to point fingers back at the governor, but the, li the word library was never mentioned anywhere in any of those statements. We talked about school, we talked about other um, businesses, retailers, um, what was essential, what was non-essential. Libraries were never mentioned. Um, I think it would have been very helpful to have that kind of universal guidance, but in any event, um, I know ILA has done a lot of advocacy along that lines, and I think as we go forward, hopefully, um, with any future um, changes, there will be some uh, address of what libraries should be doing. Um, I can't speak to why Chicago Public was one of the last libraries to close in the middle of the pandemic and was one of the first to reopen. Um, I'm sure there were a lot of internal decisions. Um, as an administrator, um, I imagine that must have been very hard to make that decision. Um, but we are going to do what is right for our community and what is right for our patrons and, and, um, and for our staff. And we're going to do so with an abundance of caution um, for health and safety. Um, and I feel, you know, having benchmarked against a number of our peer libraries, uh, that we have been very consistent. We, we weren't the first to close and we weren't the last to reopen. So we're kind of right in the middle and uh, we're, we're watching others. We're trying to learn from what other folks are doing and to try to make it uh, to, to be the best that we can. So that's that's kind of where, I, where I'm landing on all of that right now. And I think I think we're on target. Thank you. Yeah. You've got, go on. Did you want to say something, Jan? No, I just, okay. I'm agreeing. Okay. <laughs> You've got the ALA coming up, but w one correction, United for Libraries is not going to have a trustee program doing the virtual uh, ALA convention conference. And they said they would offer something later on, but they do have uh, tutorials that you can view at any, you, that you can go and assess at any time. Hmm. And will you be attending the ALA? Uh, not me personally, but we have an overwhelming response from our staff. Um, we have never been able to send so many people to the ALA conference before. So it's, it's wonderful. Um, a lot of staff are gonna be tapping into that this week. Thank you. You want to finish up? 
wrap it up. Yep. Okay. So um, last bit, um, the library will will be closed on Saturday the fourth um, for the for the holiday. Even if there will be no fireworks, um, we're still going to be closed. Um, and we will need, uh, we'll, we'll coordinate this um, amongst all y'all, but we need to set up our annual review of the minutes. So that um, is item D on your information items. We'll be in touch um, about that. Um, Jan, I'm probably gonna need your help with that coordination. That's typically one of the secretary's duties. Okay. But no, Joan is on the committee. Joan and Fina were on the audit committee. Oh, okay. Oh, so, yeah. and then, and Joan did it and I ended up doing it last year. And Joan is ready for it this year, and we'll see. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. I talked to her earlier today. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Um, and then the other piece of business that was on our agenda was that we were going to um, review, schedule the date and time of our July 21st regular meeting. Um, so we'll have to conduct that elsewhere. Um, our regular meetings would typically be held at 7:30 on the third Tuesday of the month. Um, that's what we have approved historically. Um, that said, we have been operating on a modified basis here for a while. The governor has put forth a, uh, an amendment to the way that we conduct our, our board meetings via Zoom. Um, right now, the requirement is that there needs to be at least one person physically present in the library building um, when we're conducting our meetings. So we've been doing that all along. Um, that said, if the library does move to reopen um, in July, um, that would be a week that we would be potentially open if it, if it is that third week in July. So um, we could potentially hold a meeting here in the building um, again. Uh, I think there's still a, maybe enough moving pieces at this very moment that I think we should we should discuss this a little bit more before we um, before we make a decision about it. Plus, we don't have a forum present to make time and date. So um, I still think the third Tuesday is the right day. Um, there have been a lot of folks just talking about trying to make the meeting earlier. Um, as long as we make it convenient for the public to attend um, our meeting and we post our notice as soon as we possibly can and at least within 48 hours then we're in compliance with uh, the codes that are set forth. Um, so uh, let's continue to talk about that going forward and we'll make sure that we get all of our communications out there in a timely manner. Is there any is there any old business? Any new business? Okay, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. And I'll second that. Okay, so Jan has moved to adjourn the meeting at 734 and Joan has seconded it. All in favor, we can do a voice vote for the adjournment. Say aye. 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 I, nay, nobody. The meeting's adjourned. Thank you right. and enjoy. It looks like it's getting ready to rain again. Oh, yeah. Thank All right. You. So we are adjourned at 734. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, Andrew. Have a great night. Thank you. Take care.